Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Rabbi syrahmi sadri wa yassirli amri. Wahlul bukadatan min isani. Yafqamu qawli. Amma ba'ad. So to continue, we have finished now with chapter 2 of the book, which is all about the fundamentals of Tawheed. We covered 10 fundamentals in the past few weeks, and it has been quite a while. But just to give a brief summary of what they were, fundamental one is that all names of Allah are revealed. You either find them in the Quran or in the Sunnah. Fundamental two is that Allah's names all indicate perfection. All of Allah's names and attributes are in its most perfect form. Fundamental three, well, that Allah's names and attributes are eternally with him from before and after. His creation does not increase him or decrease him in any manner whatsoever. Fundamental four is that every name implies an attribute. Fundamental five was that Allah has more attributes than he has of names. Fundamental six was Allah's attributes are of two types. The first is to, uh, to affirm a certain quality of his, and the second is to negate a certain quality that has been ascribed to him. Fundamental seven was not denying or differentiating among the names and the attributes of Allah. Fundamental eight was that Allah is not like his creation in any manner whatsoever. Fundamental nine is not saying how, and fundamental 10 is not twisting the apparent meaning of Allah's names and attributes. From today, we'll be going over chapter three, which is not too long, but it is shirk in the names of Allah. <clears throat> and so the opposite of Tawheed is shirk, which means polytheism, or the association of partners with Allah. One must have knowledge of shirk in order to avoid falling into it. Indeed, Allah says in the Quran, indeed Allah does not forgive association with him, but he forgives whatever is less than that for whom he wills. And he who associates others with Allah has certainly gone far astray. May Allah grant us protection from shirk, say amin. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he narrated that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever dies while still invoking anything other than Allah is as a rival to Allah will enter Jahannam. So to clarify, if a person dies in a state of shirk whilst associating partners with Allah, then this is the only sin that will never be forgiven and those will be in Jahannam for eternity. However, if a person commits shirk during his or her lifetime and then they repent from it, turning to worshipping Allah alone, then Allah may forgive him or her. If you look at the majority of the Sahaba, they were mushrikeen before, but then they became the best of the people. May Allah grant us a good understanding. So in the context of Allah's names and attributes, shirk can be committed in a number of ways. And today we'll go over two of them. So the first one is to give Allah's names or attributes to other than Allah. So Abu Huraira, radiallahu anh, he reported that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the most wretched person in the sight of Allah on the day of judgment and the worst person and the target of his wrath would be the person who is called the king of kings. For there is no sovereign but Allah. The Prophet sallallahu once said to Abu, uh, Abu Shuraid, because the latter answered to the title of Abu al-Hakam, father of justice, Allah is al-Hakam, the judge, and his is the judgment. So Abu Shuraid replied in his own defense that my people come to me for judgment of their disputes. And when I judge between them, both parties are happy with my judgment. So the Prophet sallallahu <coughs> He responded saying, how excellent this is. Do you have any children? And he replied, Shuray, Muslim, and Abdullah. So the Prophet wasallam asked, who is the eldest? And Abu Shuray answered, Shuray. And so he wasallam said, very well then, you are from now on known as Abu Shuray. And so we have to be careful over what we name ourselves or our children with. Allah's names and attributes are for him alone. No one and nothing is comparable to him. Therefore, giving Allah's names to other than Allah constitutes a shirk. At the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you look at the idols that were worshipped, one was named Allat, and one was named al Rusa. And Allat is derived from the Arabic word Ilah, which means deity, and something worshipped as a god. 
Al Uzza derives from the name Al Aziz, one of Allah's names, also which means the Almighty. So by calling the idols Al Lat and Al Uzza, the people, the Quraysh, they committed shirk using Allah's names. And the second is giving Allah's, Allah the names or attributes of creation. So Allah is perfect and He is above any imperfection whatsoever, any limitation or flawed ideology or anything above his creatures his creatures all of us we are flawed in one manner or another allah alone is perfect so it is not permissible to name allah with names of the creation or to attribute to allah something from the attributes of creation for example you know the christians they call him the father <clears throat> some people say mother nature or the effective cause as philosophers say you know, this is not allowed actually. And so, or as a group of Jews are quoted as saying in the Quran that indeed Allah is poor while we are rich. May Allah protect us from such things. Allah says, leave the company of those who belie or deny or utter impious speech against his names. They will be requited for what they used to do. Ibn Abbas, he commented, saying the phrase belie his names means to give him names implying shirk. This can be further explained by the words of Sheikh Al Ashqar, who mentioned three ways of committing heresy with respect to Allah's names. Number one, denying them, describing Allah with the attributes of creation, or describing created beings with Allah's names or attributes. May Allah grant us all an understanding. We'll keep a chapter over there. And so we have to be very careful over how we use the names of Allah and how we name Allah. And we can only use the names He has taught us from the Quran and the Sunnah, may Allah grant us all an understanding. Today we'll be going over the final part of the name Allah. As we've been going over it for the past uh, two weeks. And so just to give a quick recap. <clears throat> the reason why we go over the names of Allah first and foremost is to know Him. So that we can connect to Him in truth. And we can have a close and a strong relationship with Him. Number two is to connect with him through salah. That if you want to see how close you are to Allah, then look at the quality of your salah. The more khushu, the more ihsan we implement in our salah, it's a sign that we are closer to Allah. And number three is to connect to the Qur'an with true understanding. So that when we recite it, we can recite it with alladina atinahumul kitab yatlunahu haqqatilawati. True recitation is not just reciting it with the tongue, but it's understanding it, pondering over it, and implementing it in our lives. May Allah grant us all the ability to do that. And so, every single time we go over any name of Allah, it should be increasing us in these three things. First and foremost, in our du'as, in our relationship with Allah, in our relationship with the Qur'an, and with Salah. As for the recap, what we went over last week is the name Ilah and the root of it which comes from the root aliha, and it's quite common in Arabic for the Arabs to convert a hamza into a wa, which means waliha. And the word wala comes from the word waliha, which means extreme love. And so when you say la ilaha illallah, or ilah is that which you give wala to, you know, that which you love above all else. And so when you say la ilaha illallah, you are saying that Allah is the one you love above all else unconditionally. That Allah is the only one worthy of this form of love. And when you say, La ilaha illallah, you are also saying that Allah is the reason for you to do anything. The reason you get up in the morning. The reason you will walk. The reason you will talk. The reason you will do anything. Allah is the reason behind it. May Allah grant us all a good understanding. We also went over the idea that a Rabb can be disobeyed. A Lord, a Master can be disobeyed. But when Allah is the ilah, and when you love Allah, then you don't want to disobey Him. Because when you love something, you don't want to upset that. Rather, you always want to please that. And so, to prove our love for Allah, you know, Allah has set the standard in how to, you know, when we proclaim to love Allah, Allah has said, you know, there's a certain standard that if you are serious, then there's a certain way to do it. And He said, Qul in kuntum Allah. Say, if you truly love Allah, then follow me, as in follow the messenger, follow the sunnah, the messenger, I mean the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Only then will Allah love you in return. 
and thus to measure your love for Allah, let's see how much of the sunnah you implement in your life. You know, our, our clothes, are they above our ankles? So that's part of the sunnah. You know, many of us become, and we try to make excuses for it today because of a certain narration where Abu Bakr Siddiq, <coughs> he went to Rasulullah and he was quite slim. And so his, his, his lower garments always used to slide and he always used to be picking it up. So he asked Rasulullah, am I arrogant? Because keeping our clothes beneath our ankles is a sign of arrogance. And then Rasulullah said, no, you know, you're not arrogant. Yeah, that's Abu Bakr Siddiq, the best to walk upon this earth after the Anbiya. But what did he do after that? Okay, you know what? The Nabi said, I'm not arrogant, so let me just let my clothes slide way down below my ankles. No, he continued lifting it up. But then us, what we do, it's like, oh, okay, you know, I'm not arrogant, you know, so if my clothes go a little bit down, it should be okay. But it's actually not. And we know in other narrations that a person who allows his clothes to stay beneath his ankles without even making an effort, and Allah does not even look at him. And these are just the basic things, you know, do we love the beard, for example? Do we love the white thobe, knowing that Rasulullah said, it's the best of your clothing. Allahu Akbar, may Allah grant us all a good understanding. And this is just the first step, like I said, there's the sunan, you know, with all the du'as that we say when we wake up in the morning, before we eat, after we eat, before we go to sleep, when entering the toilet, when leaving the toilet. There's also the sunan that we implement in our salah. And there's also the sunnah of our character, the way we deal with people. Are we trying to behave like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? May Allah grant us all the ability to do so. May Allah grant us all his love. And may Allah grant us all the ability to prove to him how much we love him by following the sunnah as much as we can. And this is the honor of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That Allah set it as a standard. That you know, if anybody to have any sort of relationship if they want the mercy, if they want the pleasure, if they want the love of Allah, they have to go through the sunnah. If they try to go through any other way, they will not get anything. If they try to do anything outside of the sunnah, Allah will just throw it in the bin. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And so let's go over some Quranic verses regarding the name Ilah. There's something for us to ponder over and then we bring it closer to understanding and so we can appreciate the Quran a little bit more. As Allah says in Surah Nama, Qulil alhamdulillah you know, say, O oh Prophet, praise be to Allah. Wasalamun ala ibadihi ladina spafa. And peace be upon his slaves, those whom Allah has chosen. Allahu khayrun amma yushirikun. Is Allah better or what those who associate with him associate with him? Allah says, Amman khalaqa samawati wal ard. The one who created the heavens and the earth. وَأَنزَلَ لَكُمْ and Allah is adding here the kum and he, he sent down for you meaning he's speaking to each and every single one of us now he's mentioning what he's done for us وَأَنزَلَ لَكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً that he sent down for us the rains you know, from the heavens فَأَنبَتْنَا بِهِ حَدَائِقَ ذَاتَ بَهْجَةً and we caused to grow thereby gardens of beauty and delight مَا كَانَ لَكُمْ أَن تُنْبِتُوا شَجَرَهَا it was not for you, for anybody, to grow the tree. أَإِلَاهُمْ مَعَ اللَّهِ Was it another God besides Allah? Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. It was Allah alone. بَلْهُمْ قَوْمٌ يَعْدِلُونَ But no, they are a people who ascribe equals to him. أَمَّنْ جَعَلَ الْأَرْضَ قَرَارًا The one who made the earth a firm abode for us. You know, when we're walking, we're not falling in. You know, the ground is not soft for us to lose our balance. We are able to walk firmly, fast, in a beautiful manner. Allah <coughs> Akbar. And he made in its midst the rivers. And he placed the mountains in or on the earth to stabilize it. As Allah says, in Surah Anbiya, that Allah placed the mountains so that the earth does not move as we walk. And if you wanted to be walking and the mountains wasn't there to keep the land firm, then the, it would be shaking all the time. Allahu Akbar. And then how would we walk? How would we have any soul, any form of stability? وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَ الْبَحْرَيْنِ حَاجِزًا And Allah made between the two seas a barrier. And you go to some places in the world, subhanAllah, you can see it with your own eyes. When I was in South Africa before, I went to Cape Town. And in Cape Town, you see where the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean meets. And in the middle, there's a white line. A white line of foam, and they do not mix. 
You go to one side of the area is called Cape Point. You go to one side, the water is freezing cold. You go to the other side, it's nice and warm. One side is salty, one side is not, or less salty. SubhanAllah, who could have done that? Is there anybody else who can place a barrier, an invisible barrier in the waters to stop them from mixing? Allahu Akbar, walillahi alhamd. A ilahu ma'allah. Was it another God with Allah? Was it another ilah with Allah? Bal akhtaruhum la ya'alamun. No, but majority of them do not know. Allah continues to say, Ammi yujibul mutarra idha da'a. Allahu Akbar. The one who responds to the distressed when he calls out to him. Wayakshifu su. And he removes whatever evil is afflicting that individual. Wayaja'awukum khulafa al ard. And he makes you successors upon the land. Is there any other that can remove our difficulties? Is there any other that can grant us the succession upon the land? But how little is it that they remember, that we remember? Or the one who guides you in the darknesses of the land and the sea? And who sends the winds as glad tidings for the coming of his mercy in the rains. Before the rains come, the winds come to indicate that the mercy of Allah is coming. Is it another God besides Allah? Allahu Akbar. Ta'ala Allahu Amma Yishrikun. Now far above is Allah over what they associate with him. Or the one who originates the creation. Is al the one who originated all of the creation. And then he repeats it. He repeats the creation first and foremost. He will repeat our creation on the day of judgment as he resurrects us. But we also see it happening around us with the water cycles. Every year, the trees, the plants, they all die in winter. And then in summer, they come back alive. If you look at the cycle of time, you look at the cycle of night and day, Allahu Akbar, of, of, of the orbiting of the planets, all of it is in a constant cycle. Is there any other that, other than Allah who does that? And the one who provides for you from the heavens and the earth. Is it another ilah with Allah? No. Say, O Prophet, bring your proof, bring your evidence if what you claim is truthful. And these are just some verses, you know, subhanAllah, some of the most beautiful verses in the Quran, just for us to ponder over. Allah says, that, and this is in Surah Qaf, you know, we can say this is the end game. That, وَجَاءَ سَكْرَةُ الْمَوْتِ بِالْحَقِّ And finally, there will come to you the intoxication of death. In truth, ذَلِكَ مَا كُنْتَ مِنْهُ That is what you were trying to run away from. And then after that, وَنُفِخَ فِي السُّورِ The trumpet will be blown. ذَلِكَ يَوْمُ الْمَعِيدِ That is the day when Allah carries out His threat. Allahu Akbar. The wording also is so powerful. وَجَاءَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَعَهَا سَائِقٌ وَشَهِيدٌ And every soul will come with it, a driver to take him to the judgment, and a shaheed, a witness, carrying the reports. Allah will say, لَقَدْ كُنْتَ فِي غَفْلَةٍ مِنْ هَذَا That certainly you are in heedlessness of this. فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ But we have removed that heedlessness from you. فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حَدِيدٌ And so your sight on this day is sharp. Everybody will see the truth on that day. And then the angel, the witness, he will say, هذا ما لدي عتيد. You know, here is with me his record. Allah will say, Al-Qiyah fi Jahannam. You know, throw, fling into Jahannam. كل عنيد. Every disbeliever, stubborn. Every stubborn or persistent disbeliever. من للخير, the stopper or the preventer of good. The one who tried to stop good things happening, or from us to do good deeds. Mu'addad, every transgressor, and murib, every person who doubted the promises of Allah. And then Allah says, الَّذِي جَعَلَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر. And as for those who set up an ilah with Allah, فَأَلْقِيَاهُ فِي الْعَذَابِ الشَّدِيدِ Throw him into the most severe punishment. May Allah protect us from shirk. May Allah protect us from shirk. Say, Ameen. And also from minor shirk. No, riya, 
to show off, to do things for other than the sake of Allah. A way we can protect ourselves, a dua, is Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min an ushrika bika shay'an a'lamu wa astaghfiruka lima la a'lamu. You're asking Allah to protect you from associating any partners with him knowingly and to forgive you for doing it unknowingly. And so how can we live by the name Allah? Number one is to believe in him. And Islam means that we submit to our creator. And this is based on five concepts or the five pillars of Islam. Number one, actually we'll get to number one last. Number two is salah, to establish the five salah. Number three is to fast in the month of Ramadan. Number four is to give in zakat, to purify ourselves. And number five is to perform the hajj even once in our lives if we can afford it. And the first pillar is to believe, is to the shahada, to believe in Allah <coughs> and to believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the final messenger. And belief, iman, it has six articles. Amantu billah, that we believe in Allah. Wa malaika and his angels. Wa kutubin, the books that was revealed. Warusuli, the messengers that brought them. Wal yawmil akhir, and the final day, or the day of judgment. Wal qadri khayrihi wa sharri, and the qadr min Allah ta'ala. The qadr of good and evil is both from the qadr of Allah. That no matter what happens, it is always with Allah's permission. And so, think about it, that our iman, our belief in Allah, when some difficulty comes to you, are you 100% sure that this is from the qadr of Allah, a test for us. To put it simply, anything that brings us closer to Allah, even if it's a negative, maybe you lost something, maybe you lost your health, maybe you lost your job, maybe you've been going through difficulties in your relationships, but it brought you closer to Allah, then it's a blessing in disguise. But anything that takes you away or makes you distant from Allah, even if it's something good, Maybe it's a new job, maybe you got married, maybe good things started happening to you, but you forgot Allah, then that's in actuality a punishment from Allah. May Allah protect us. When you, number two actually, so the next thing, how we can live by the name of Allah is jihad, to strive, to struggle and to make an effort in three aspects in our life. Number one is in our ibadah, especially in our salah, to implement khushu, to implement ihsan. Ihsan is excellence. So in its physical forms, to perfect every position in salah. And also the understanding of salah. That when we are in our salah, we have to understand what we are saying. This is part of the perfection of salah. When we come together for the jama'ah, part of the perfection of salah is to ensure that the rows are straight, that there are no gaps between you. And that, you know, subhanAllah, it is part of the perfection of the establishment of salah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sometimes, he used to walk between the rows and he used to ensure that everybody was closing their gaps. There are some ulama who even went to the extent and say that because he used to do that himself, it's wajib for us to do so. But that's taking a bit too far. Rather, it's better to give the reminder that look, straighten your rows, ensure that there's no gaps. There's so much of you know, corruption that comes if we don't do that. For example, if there are gaps between you in salah, then shaitan will come and he'll distract you in your salah. And then you're busy complaining that why can I not have any khushu? Why can I not concentrate on the Qur'an? You've got the gaps between you. You don't want to move side to side. Allahu Akbar. You, when you come up for the second rakah, you don't care there's a big gap sitting right next to you. What's going to happen? On top of that, if the rows are not straight, Allah will break the rows. Allah will turn your hearts away from one another. You see today, right? How many sects there are in Islam? Can we even get our first row straight? Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us all forgiveness. Say Ameen. Number two, striving in our personality, in our hearts, to purify ourselves from the diseases in our hearts, to ensure that there's no envy, there's no grudges, there's no arrogance, there's no pride, there's no you know hatred towards the qadr of Allah or negative thinking towards others or injustice in our hearts. Number three is to strive to establish his deen. Aqimuddin walat tafarraku fi. To establish his deen and to not differ in it thereafter. And so we can all be making an effort with this. In another way, living by the name of Allah means, and you know, living by the deeper meaning of ilah in every single aspect, <coughs> including all of your relationships, is that you love Allah alone. And anything that you love thereafter 
is for his sake. And anything that you dislike thereafter is for his sake. You trust Allah alone. And anybody that you trust after that is for Allah's sake. That you prefer Allah, you prefer his days, the akhirah, you prefer his pleasure. You wouldn't disobey Allah just to please the creation. Allahu Akbar. You rely, you depend, and you expect from Allah alone. Realizing that nobody can do anything for you. you know, no matter who it is, nobody can even smile at you if Allah does not allow them to. And so you expect any good from Allah alone whilst trying your best to be good to his creation around you. The only one that you would exert yourselves for, that you would exhaust yourselves for, use your entire 100% effort for, is Allah. For He alone can punish you and He alone can reward you. Allahu Akbar. And even if the people turn against you, you know that Allah is in complete control. And Allah says, Ma min musibatin illa bi idnillah. No calamity, no musibah, no difficulty can come to you except by the permission of Allah. Is somebody abusing you today? It's with the permission of Allah. Is your health being taken away from you today? It's with the permission of Allah. And it's with the permission of Allah that some that it can be relieved or the burdens can be taken away. As Allah says, Whoever has iman in Allah, whoever believes in Allah, Allah will guide his heart through it. And that is the greatest gift given to us, the believers. Allah says in Surah Furqan, you know, Allah has made some of us as a fitna, a fitan, a test or a trial for others amongst us. Our <coughs> spouses can be a fitna for us. You know, are they making you angry all the time perhaps? Or are you always being angry with them all the time? Your children, your wealth, anything, even your friends. When we come to the masjid, we can end up being a fitna for one another. We have to ask Allah to protect us from being a fitna for one another. Rather, we want to be a blessing for one another. Allahumma ja'alna mubarakan. May Allah make us all blessed for one another, encouraging one another to goodness. Say Ameen. And so, SubhanAllah, even when it comes to your du'as, sometimes we make du'a, and we're making du'a, and we're making du'a, and then we say Allah has not responded to that du'a. Rasulullah said, Allah will respond to your du'a for as long as you are not hasty. And so the Sahaba asked, you know, how can I be hasty in my du'a? And Rasulullah said is that you make dua to Allah, but then after some time you say that I made dua, but Allah never responded. Rather, Allah responds to all du'as in His timing. Sometimes we are in a difficulty and we're making dua, Ya Allah, you know, help me, relieve me of this difficulty, relieve me of this difficulty. And rather, He's smiling at you. Why is He smiling at you? Because He's already relieved you of the difficulty and the relief is just around the corner. But just because we don't see it sometimes, we start becoming impatient, we start throwing tantrums. Ya Allah, why are you still keeping me in this difficulty? And he's just smiling at you, saying, just a little bit more. And I'm just rewarding you with this little time that you have to wait. Just wait a little bit longer, be patient. You know, demonstrate sovereign jameel, beautiful patience, and you're going to be rewarded for it, and the difficulty is going to go away anyway. <coughs> Allahu Akbar. Knowing that Allah never abandons his faithful slaves. Ma wa da'aka rabbuka wa ma qala. Allah does not hate you, nor has he abandoned you, nor has he forsaken you. Knowing that Allah is always by your side. And if Allah has to abandon you, subhanAllah, we're doomed because nobody else can support us. Nobody else can help us with anything. Every single time we stand in salah, we say, Isti'ana, to seek Allah's help because He is Al Musta'an, the one whose help is sought. All of His creation seeks His help. Every single day, the sun is seeking Allah's help in order to fulfill what Allah has commanded him to do to rise and then to set. Every single day, the birds, the animals, everything is seeking Allah's help in order to fulfill His commandments that He has commanded them to do. And so when you say, La ilaha illallah, you know, feel it. Don't just say it with your tongue, but feel it. Know that there is no deity except Allah. And ask for forgiveness for your sin. That's in Surah Muhammad. Now, do you truly feel when you say, La ilaha illallah? This statement brought you into the safe threshold of Islam. And your Creator chose you to be of those who are willing to utter it, unlike many others on this earth. The Prophet said, the best dhikr, the best remembrance of Allah is saying, La ilaha illallah. And the best dua is saying, Alhamdulillah. So each time you say that, La ilaha illallah, you know, in prayer or any other time, in the, in, think about the real meaning 
of his words and increase in using this invocation and saying it from the bottom of your heart. Another way we can live by the name Allah is to say Bismillah. We, we, Rasulullah said that any significant act that does not begin with Bismillah is cut away from blessings. Allahu Akbar. And so when you say the Bismillah, when you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, you know, if anything that you do, first and foremost, it should make us conscious of Allah. That we are going to do something, you know, let's say if it's not really a good thing, it may help us not fall into sin. When we are about to do something good, it may help us improve our sincerity or improve our ikhlas or our khushu and our ihsan. And so make it a habit, teach yourselves and also teach your children and your families around you to always say Bismillah before you do anything. And finally, turn to Him alone. Allah describes the beautiful and direct relationship between himself and the believer. When he says, O oh, son of Adam, so long as you call upon me, having hope in me, I shall forgive you for your sins, for whatever you have done, and I won't care what you did. Allahu Akbar. O oh, son of Adam, were your sins to reach the clouds in the sky, and were you then to ask forgiveness of me, I shall forgive you. O oh, son of Adam, were you to come with me with an earth full of sins and you were then to face me not associating partnership with me then I shall grant you an earth full of pardon Allahu Akbar that's Allah Allahu Akbar so turn to Allah in times of ease and in times of difficulty praising him Alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal as we know from another narration that the first people to be called on the day of judgment are those who yahmadun Allah fissarrai wa barra those who praised Allah upon every single situation, if ease came to them, alhamdulillah. If difficulty came to them, alhamdulillah. This is to the qadr of Allah. My Lord hasn't abandoned me. Everything that happens to me is for a good reason. If Allah tests me with some difficulty, it's to wash away my sins, it's to elevate my status, it's so that I don't have to account for anything on the day of judgment. May Allah grant us all jannah to through those bighayri hisab, without hisab. Say ameen. And finally, we'll go over a few du'as that is revolving around the name Ila. And there are some quite important du'as or forms of adhkar that we need to know. So number one, praises which leads to our forgiveness. So Ali radiallahu an, he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to me, shall I not teach you some words, which if you were to say, Allah would forgive you, even if he already forgave you before. You know, sometimes we're thinking of our past sins and we're feeling guilty over it. And we just need to say this, and then we'd be forgiven again for it. And that is, La ilaha illallah. There is none worthy of worship except Allah. Al Halim al Kareem. The most forbearing, the most generous, the most noble. La ilaha illallah wa ali al Azim. There is none worthy of worship except Allah. Al Ali, the most high. Al Azim, the most great, the most tremendous, the most magnificent. Subhanallah. You know, glorified and perfect is Allah. Rabbi samawati sabari wa Rabbi al-arsh al The Lord of the seven heavens and the Lord of the great throne. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And all praise is for Allah, the Lord of the universe. When you say this, Allah will forgive you for any of your sins, even if you were already forgiven before. A dhikr to say when we are in a form of distress. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would invoke Allah at the time of any distress with the following words La ilaha illallah al-azimul halim you know, all, There is none worthy of worship except Allah the most great, the most forbearing La ilaha illallah rabbul arsh al-azim There is none worthy of worship except Allah the Lord of the great or the magnificent throne La ilaha illallah There is none worthy of worship except Allah Rabbu al-Samawat wa Rabbu al-Ard wa Rabbu al-Arsh al -Karim. The Lord of the Heavens, the Lord of the Earth, and the Lord of the Noble Throne. And the best dua, this is known as the best dua, and it's the dua that each and every single Prophet of Allah made. And we are also encouraged to say this dua on Yawm al-Arafah, the day of Arafah. And that is, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la shaykhana lahul mulk. 
that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, Wahda, alone, la sharika, without any partners. Lahul mulk wa lahul hamd. To him belongs all dominion and to him belongs all praise. Wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. And he is over all things, able or competent. But rather we use this within the context that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is being narrated by Abu Dhar. That whoever says the above, or what we just mentioned, ten times, after Maghrib and after Fajr, while sitting in the position of Tahajjud. So after you finish your salam, you're still sitting in the position of Tahajjud and you say this ten times, then six things are done. Number one, Allah will write for you ten good deeds. Allah will forgive you for ten sins. Allah will raise you in ten ranks. So that's three rewards so far. Number four, it will be a shield for you from all repulsive things and it will be a guard for you from shaitan. And number five, no sin will be allowed to reach you on that day except for shirk. This means that no sin will come or you know, Allah will protect you from falling into a sin that would invalidate any of your deeds. Allahu Akbar. Or a sin that could destroy you such as harming the Muslims or the creation of Allah. And number six, that he will be from the best of the people, except for those who say it an equal amount of time or more. And finally, or rather second last, we'll go over two more. Another one is the form of adhkar that we say when we enter the marketplace. That is, la ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika la, lahul mulk wa lahul hamd. Yuhyi wa yumeet, wa huwa hayyul la yamut, bi yadihil khayr, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. That la ilaha illallah. There is none worthy of worship except Allah. Wahdahu la sharika la, alone and without any partners. Lahul mulk wa lahul hamd. To him belongs all dominion and to him belongs all praise. Yuhyi wa yumeet. He gives life and he causes death. And he is the ever living and he never dies. All good is in his hands. And he is over all things powerful. If you say this when entering a shop, Allahu Akbar, Allah writes for you one million good deeds. Allahu Akbar. One million good deeds. On top of that, you are forgiven for one million sins. And on top of that, Allah builds for you a house in Jannah. May Allah grant us all the ability to say this every time we walk into a shop. Subhanallah. Sometimes I used to tell my students before to say this, and then my one student came to me, he's like, oh, you know, the other day I just entered the shop, left it, entered the shop, left it, entered the shop, left it, and he kept on doing it. <laughs> Allah Akbar. And finally, Allah says in the Quran, وَذَنْ regarding Yunus alayhi salam, the companion of the way, إِذَّهَبَ مُغَاضِبًا When he stomped away from his people in a state of anger, and he thought that Allah wouldn't decree with, you know, against him or hold him accountable for that. And then the whale swallowed him. So and he called out from the darknesses when there was no way out. You know, all the doors were closed for him. He was in the darkness of the belly of the whale, in the darkness of the sea, in the darknesses of the night. So three forms of darknesses. And he called out from the darknesses and Allah heard him. And what did he say? La ilaha illa ant. Subhanak. Inni kuntu min That there is none worthy of worship except you. How perfect you are. Indeed, I have been of the wrongdoers. And subhanAllah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah says, Fastajabana. You know, we responded to him. Wanajaynahu min al -ham. And we saved him from his grief. Wa kadhalika nunjil mu'mineen. And just like that, we save all the true believers. Allahu Akbar. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that not a single Muslim supplicates with this dua. They say, La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu min al Except three things happen. Number one, Allah responds to you. Number two, Allah removes any difficulty that is in your way. And number three, Allah grants you whatever you ask for. And so when we begin our dua, Let's always begin with this. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-dhanimeen. But we need to know how to apply it. We need to know how to actually apply it so that we can attain these benefits. And so number one is invoking Allah, affirming that there is none worthy of worship except Him, singing from your heart, understanding that He is in complete control. And when you say subhanak, you're also declaring Allah's absolute perfection. 
When you say, Inni kuntu min al-dhalimin, you're thinking of some sin of yours that you have done. You know, and you're feeling guilty over it. So it's not just with the tongue, but rather it's with the heart that we say this. And Allah will grant us whatever we ask for thereafter. And that brings us to the end of today's uh, topic. And that also brings us to finishing the discussion on Allah's name, Allah, and the explanation of Ilah. And perhaps next week we'll start going over another name. May Allah grant us all the ability to live by his names. And the epitome of living by his names is making dua. That if we truly believe in the names of Allah, when we know the names of Allah, we make dua with it. SubhanAllah. You want Allah to open the way for you. Ya Fattah. Open the way for me. You want Allah to fix your situations. Ya Jabbar. Fix my situation. This is how we bring the name of Allah to life in our hearts. أقول قولي هذا سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك